television highlights of the news of yesteryear. in the making early in 1934 as Italy trains for war. King Victor Emmanuel and Marshal Bodomo, one-time commander of Italian forces in an earlier conflict with Ethiopia, inspect graduate officers. Soon this make-believe is to become real combat, for on December 9, 1934, there is to be the initial clash between Ethiopian and Italian soldiers in Italian Somaliland. Africa, January 10, 1935. Italy, refusing to arbitrate its frontier dispute, sends its fighting forces to battle. Marshal Badoglio in command of many of Italy's 70,000 troops. You are seeing actual battle scenes as Italy attacks Haile Selassie's men on two fronts. Ethiopia's protest to the League of Nations is in vain, and the Italian advance continues. Italy's General Graziani heading the southern frontal attack. Ethiopia counts on its rainy season as an ally to bog down Italy's mechanized forces. But the rain holds off, and Graziani penetrates 125 miles up the Weber Chevalier River Valley. Meanwhile, Emperor Haile Selassie, revered Ethiopian leader, urges his subjects to repulse the invader, and his tribesmen respond with a frantic fury. Badly equipped, woefully ill-trained, the Ethiopians match their spirit against the enemy's armor. Final battle of the war. Italian guns rake the road to Addis Ababa. Stark horror is in the wake of Italian bombers blasting native fortifications and clearing the way for charging hordes of Italian trained cavalrymen, clearing out the Ethiopian defenders left after bombs and bullets have claimed their toll. Last stage of the war. Selassie, Lion of Judah, has been forced to flee to Palestine, leaving a lost land behind. In Rome, May 5th, 1936, crowds rush to hear Benito Mussolini at the Piazza Venezia officially announce the end of the war. Ethiopia has been annexed, a 40-year-old defeat avenged. Mussolini's moment of glory, the crowd which in 1945 is to tear him to pieces hails him as a conquering hero. April 1939, and New York prepares for its greatest exposition, the World's Fair. Wait a minute, what's this? Don't be alarmed, friends. It's merely men putting the finishing touches to the huge diorama of New York City, which will be a feature of the fair. A model city of 4,000 buildings covering almost a city block and nearly 40 feet in height, designed to tell the story of New York to Flushing Meadow visitors. April 30th, Mayor LaGuardia and Grover Whalen officially open the New York World's Fair with Mayor LaGuardia receiving the first passport. Symbolizing the theme of the exposition, the Trilon and Perisphere. It's opening day, and New York is waiting to welcome the world. Nineteen twenty-nine, and fighting Georges Clemenceau, French premier, dies in his eighty-eighth year. Member of the Big Four, which headed the Peace Pact Committee of World War I, Clemenceau, shown here reviewing French troops, suffered a severe cold at Versailles. Volcanic, vigorous, and impetuous, he worked tirelessly for France throughout his life. Shortly after inspecting war ruins, he visited America, doing much to cement Franco-American relations. At Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., Clemenceau pays his respects to the great emancipator. 
first named premier in 1906, then again in 1917, this was Georges Clemenceau, the fighting tiger of France. She waves, she wiggles, she dances. Most famous shimmy shaker of them all, Fatima, star of the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, immortalized by these museum piece movies, among the first ever made. Look at that gal go. The one, the only, the inimitable Fatima. Charles Evans Hughes, after 20 years of public life, retires in 1923. Hughes, who in 1916 went to sleep believing he was the president of the United States, only to have a latent California vote elect Wilson, is succeeded as Secretary of State under Coolidge by Frank B. Kellogg. Newport, Rhode Island, and Lieutenant Ralph Pulitzer, famous publisher, gives the government a submarine chaser. Lieutenant Pulitzer is the son of Joseph Pulitzer, who endowed the series of literature prizes that bears his name. 1929, and the Ile de France arrives in New York, bringing the French theatrical idol, Maurice Chevalier. The smiling singing comedian is en route to Hollywood to make his first movie, Innocence of Paris. in 1936 and fashions have gone to the heads of some girls. This is the latest in hair do's and don'ts. Forerunner of the upsweep is this curl creation. I hope the Greeks had a word for the style now being created. Woman's crowning glory gets a good going over as the Florida season gets off to a head start. We're still in Florida to see some seaweed costumes and meet Annette Kellerman, dancing belle of Granddad's Day. It's a bathing suit fashion show, and the accessories of old are on display for Father Neptune and company. Here's a fetching number and some 1890 novelties. The Annette Kellerman overall coverall. And now for the 1936 stuff. First of the scanty suits, leaving much to the elements, but little to the imagination. Personal record of the crash that almost cost the lives of Amy and Jim Mollison, British cross-Atlantic flying team. July 23, 1933, and an attempted non-stop flight from the coast of Wales winds up in disaster near Bridgeport, Connecticut. Injured, but thankful for their escape, the Mollisons tell their story. No one could have been kind or more considerate, and it's largely owing to their help that, well, I at any rate, receiving almost myself again. I'm afraid Jim got the worst of it, but you'll be all right in a day or two, won't you? Anyway, we are very, very grateful to everyone. Okay. Well, I would just like to repeat what Amy has told you. I'm more than grateful to everyone in Bridgeport, and I'm especially glad to be going back to New York again. Flown to Ford Bennett Field, which ironically was the objective of their original plans, the Mollisons have to be helped from the plane. More seriously injured of the two is Jim Mollison, but the undaunted pair insist they'll try it again. Better luck next time. Central Park, New York, 1932. And Georgia Coleman gets into the swim with a dive. The national champion in a somersault one and a half. Georgia again in a front jackknife with a half twist. 
Championship form in this front one and a half somersault. Let's hear from you, Georgia. Glad to be diving again at Central Park. Just can't keep away. Helping to bring home the bacon. Swim star is Elaine Madison after a record in the 500 meter freestyle. Martha Marinius holds the world's record now, but will there be a new title holder when Helene hits the finish? Only seconds now. Let her tell you herself. I'm very happy to say that I broke the world's record in the 500 meters today. This record was held by Martha Aurelius, and I never expected to break it, let alone break it by 10 seconds. Thank you. Still 1932, Jersey City, New Jersey. The track's fast, and so are those gals. In the lead is Stella Walsh, loser in two events today. But this one's different. I'm very happy to have won the final of this 220-yard race. It was very tough going, but came through all right. Had some hard luck today, too. It's just been my off night, that's all. The 80-meter hurdle with America's leading women athletes in competition for the AAU championships. The winner, Mildred Bay Dietrichson. I'm certainly glad that I won this race, and they say that I broke a new world record in quad flight, which is, uh, oh, and hold it off there. <laughs> I'm certainly glad to have won it, and glad to be here in New Jersey.